the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. You know, I absolutely love the West, the Old West, the Rockies, the mountains, the cathedrals in the sky, Colorado, New Mexico. And you see, my conundrum is that I also absolutely love the sea, the Atlantic. Growing up in North Carolina, it's a problem when you live in the Piedmont in the middle of the state and you got the beautiful mountains to the west, the beautiful beaches and coastline to the east, and you cannot be in both places at the same time. Truth is, you can't be in the same places at the same time. Kind of like Babylon. In the kingdom of heaven, the earthly city, and the heavenly city. Or maybe you could be in both places. Perhaps you could. The image of beautiful tall ships from an era long ago sailing the seas is one of beauty and strength. And upon closer inspection, they're fragile. And they're vulnerable to the toils of the sea. As one enters my office here at the church, one of the first images that you will see as you go through the door is a small copy of the famous painting, a famous painting that hangs in the White House. There are many, but there's one. And this one is called The Mouth of the Delaware. It's by Thomas Birch, 1828. And what I love about this painting is the tall ships and the small boats are maneuvering the rough seas as a major storm brews in the Atlantic and begins to move inland. And all the ships are frantically turning around as they head for the safety of the Delaware River except one tall ship which is heading directly and calmly into the storm as chaos and anxiety paints the scene. It is a symbol of leadership where that ship and its captain and its crew are moving forward with confidence but in humility. It is pastoral in the sense of reasonable calm in the face of adventure and challenge. Because challenge comes with adventure. On the one hand, it does speak to leadership and its better qualities, if you will. But in the context of today, and in the context of these readings, it foreshadows as well the freedom The danger of freedom. The many dangers of freedom. The freedom of the sea and its allure. The freedom of life itself and its allure. There are so many things, there are so many gods with a little g that seek to separate us from the Lord and the heavenly city in this freedom because we live in this freedom. As Paul says this morning, and you just heard in Ephesians, our struggle is against cosmic powers of this present darkness. Things that we perhaps cannot see, but we can feel. And we know they're there. And they're dangerous. Spiritual forces of evil. Scottish theologian, Peter Forsyth said, unless there is within us that which is above us, we shall soon yield to that which is about us. For the first duty of every soul 
is to find not its freedom, but its master. To focus in on the soul's source of life. First and foremost at all times. And it was said that the old choice which still is presented to every soul, the old crisis which reappears in every experience that you and I step into and live in, Caesar or Christ? That is the question. The vast, attractive, skeptical world with its pleasures and ambitions and its prodigal promise or the meek, majestic, and winning figure of Him, of Nazareth. The election remains for each of us. And the moment of the election, in the shaded and solemn valley of decision, will be memorable in our own history when suns for us have ceased to shine. This morning we see many followers of Jesus, disciples we are told, who walk away in the face of uncertainty and challenge, even as they stand face to face with God Himself right there, eyes to eyes, heart to heart. They walk away. They choose not to follow. The kingdom of heaven is standing right there in front of them. And Jesus tells us that some, maybe many, He doesn't tell us how many, were unable to handle the rigor of the way. Jesus says, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to Me unless it is granted by My Father. Which tells us that only the Lord can move our hearts to seek Him. It can never be forced. You tell me when in the course of history someone or a group of someones have been forced to genuinely convert to the faith. It cannot be forced. It is the movement of God. And many become hostile to this message. They allow themselves to be separated from God. It is the cosmic spiritual battle. You may have been there yourself. You may be there now. They make their choice. And yet Peter and the other eleven, we are told, and we see they step forward in faith and belief and they lean into it. Although they didn't understand fully, they knew there would be tests, but they didn't know exactly what they would be. They didn't know exactly where they were going. They were still trying to understand who this Jesus was and is. Nor do we know what is ahead. And we shouldn't. There is a test here for us as well, whether we like it or not. Yes, change can be scary. Change can be uncertain. Who, raise your hand if you like change. Change. Three people. (laughs) If there's one thing in life that remains constant, it's change. Those early disciples were full of fear. They didn't know where they were going and following Jesus. And if you remember, even when they were in that upper room, they were filled with fear. And it took the Holy Spirit to indwell in them to lead them out of that room and into the world taking this Gospel, this good news. You know, fear and uncertainty is everywhere. It is not unlike the beginning of a new school year. I used to fear that day in grade school. I didn't want the summer to end. Or a new job. The uncertainty that lay ahead. Or a new program year in a church. And a new schedule. This morning, David, I don't know 
where David is. David mentioned at the 8 o'clock service it felt like daylight savings. <laughs> but we still showed up. Change is tough. And you know why it's tough? Because we are not so certain what is in it for us personally. We are concerned about ourselves, and that makes sense. It's part of our human nature. We're concerned what it means for us. What might we lose? What might we gain? But the truth is, and I'm, I'm only 52 years old. I'll be 53 at the end of the year. But I have come to learn this in my own life. The truth is, is that when change And it's not easy. But when change and healthy disruption come along, it is an opportunity for growth and healthy movements. This too is the work of God. Change has arrived in this Gospel this morning. We just heard it. Jesus is on the move. Life is for the living. The dead will take care of the dead, as Jesus says. There are many hearts to move and He is calling us to follow and to participate. To leave the safety and the comfort of the temple. The holy temple. And this will be a common theme in the coming weeks as we study these Gospels Sunday after Sunday into October. You know, I was having a conversation with a pastor, colleague, and friend of mine from years ago about these things that separate us from God and from one another. And my friend said, you know, when I was a boy, my father always, always told me, and he instilled it in me, despite my many failings, that as we plowed the fields on the farm, the plow must remain in its path at all times. It cannot leave that path. It is moving forward. Yes, dirt will be moved violently and quickly to both sides and beyond. But he said, son, remember, that dirt is coming back. That dirt will be coming back to the center where you have plowed. And guess what? God will grow there. God will grow there. For the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. To fix our eyes on the purpose and the reason for living. What is life? And discovering it in the journey, the purpose is found in the journey. Not necessarily the destination. You see, your life and my life are on the line. We are standing right now in the desert of Babylon. The desert of this world. The earthly city. Where we are citizens of two kingdoms. But with hearts deeply, deeply longing for the heavenly city. The city of God. We need the place of hope and comfort. This place. What we do here. But it's not our final destination. The point of the journey is not to arrive. The point of departure is not to return. Because anything can happen. The point of the journey is to discover and to learn and to trust, and to allow ourselves to become what God envisions for us. It is God's dream for us. God's dream. And it's a good dream. And this is to bring the light of Christ to the city of Babylon in improving and moving and changing hearts and lives one at a time in this kingdom where we reside.
You know, recently, my family, Susie and I and all the, the kids, went out west on a trip, Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, 2,400 miles driving. We're tired. <laughs> and along the way, as we were driving, as I was driving, one of my sons in the back kept saying, and I won't tell you who it is. It's one of two. <laughs> but he kept talking about how we could get to where we were going the fastest. And I found myself saying, and I thought it a, lot, a lot about it this week, stop. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Look at what's around you. Take it in. Don't focus on getting to that point. We'll get there. So where are we headed? That's the question. We are headed for the heart. The heart. It's all about the heart of humanity and all creation. Jesus had a heart for the people. He spent 80% of His earthly ministry in the Galilee, around the shores of the lake, walking alongside all sorts of people, people like you and me. And it is in Galilee where the grief and where the fear and the uncertainty and the hopelessness were transformed and are transformed. It is in Galilee that this broken group of followers, you and me, experience wholeness and healing. They receive a new beginning, a new call to preach this incredible message of love, the love of Christ, the light of Christ. It is the same light of Christ that we know here, that we have discovered here, that feeds us. And we are called to take it out of this place to the folks in Galilee, in the earthly city, in the ways that we do it, in the ways individually we are called in the earthly city. As Jeremiah 29 says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. It means going to the peripheries, speaking from the heart to another's heart, heart to heart, an incarnational theology. We do it here, and we are called to go forth in the various ways to bring this hope and this grace to the hearts of God's people, all people. And you know what? This is another thing that I've learned, and I know many of you have as well, that when we do this, our very own hearts will be moved, and they will be changed in the process. It's just how the Lord works. It's how the Lord works. It is shining the light of Christ in our gatherings, in our growings, and in our goings. Because we're on this ship together. And we are on this sea, sailing through this earthly city. We are brushing up against and welling up and sweeping over the hearts of God's people, bringing the light of Christ, walking alongside one another. And in the distance, on the horizon, our eyes are fixed on those mountains, those beautiful mountains, the city of God. And to get there, which we will, we must seek peace. And we must seek prosperity right here in our own backyard and beyond. So what does it look like? Stay tuned. Amen. <laughs>